one of the reasons why it's such a big challenge, besides just if we're p- competitive and we're passionate about our sport, it's the fact that uh, I think if you're, if you're a leader of any organization, then you got to take care of your people. And your people now are your players, and your players kind of become a second family to you. And just like those commercials they have on TV when, when mom and dad pops her head in and the, and the little baby's sitting there and uh, mom and dad say, well, I'm sick today, I'm, I'm going to take the day off. And the kid kind of looks at him like, what, are you kidding me? You don't have that option. And the same way, it's at, that's the reality of your, of your life as a, as a parent. And as a coach, you feel like that too. I mean, your, your, your players, they depend on you, they need on you. So you feel like you're 24-7 and whatever they need, I'm there for them. And, and it can consume you if you let it. Welcome to the Cutting Edge Coaching Podcast, where we believe coaches are some of the most important teachers and leaders in the world, and they deserve to be supported. I'm your host, Luke Gromer, and every week we're bringing you conversations with coaches, experts, and leaders from across sports that will give you practical ideas and strategies that you can apply in your coaching to develop high-performing teams and high-character people. Coaches, I'm excited to welcome Mike Lynch to the podcast. Mike is currently in his eighth season as head women's soccer coach at Belmont Abbey in North Carolina. He has over three decades of coaching experience that span the Division 1, 2, and 3 levels. Mike also played soccer at the Air Force Academy and served as an officer in the United States Air Force. In this conversation, we talk about life and career balance in coaching, confidence and mental performance, intentional ways to connect with players, and true peak performance. If you enjoy the episode and want to grab a copy of the free podcast notes, just go to cuttingedgecoach.com slash podcast or click the link in the show details to download a free PDF of notes from this episode or any episode of the podcast. And coaches, I'm excited to announce a new online workshop I'm hosting with Doug Lamov, Film for Coaches. It's a 90-minute interactive online workshop where we're going to dive deep into how to use film effectively to increase the learning and development of your players and teams. The workshop will include presentations, video examples of film sessions, a Q&A, and more. Spots are limited, so go to filmforcoaches.com or click the link in the show details to learn more or register before it fills up. And one note about this episode before we hop in. This conversation was recorded live at a coaching convention, so there may be a bit of background noise at times, but we did our best to edit the audio to bring you the highest quality possible. Now to my conversation with Mike Lynch. Enjoy the episode. Coach is excited to welcome Coach Mike Lynch to the podcast. Uh, Coach Lynch, thanks for joining me, and I would love it if you started off and just shared a little bit about where you are in coaching currently and your journey to get there. Thank you, Luke. Um, yeah, so I currently am the women's soccer coach at Belmont Abbey College, just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. I've been there for ten years, and uh, prior to that, I um, took a path of in and out of coaching. My, you know, my first 30 years, I grew up as a military brat. So we moved all over the place. And then like the next 30 years, I, I felt like I was in the military because I kept moving all over the place, but, uh, in and out of coaching, I was an assistant coach at the air force Academy on the men's side. And then I, um, got the head, uh, men's job at Truman state in Kirksville, Missouri, which is another great institution. Was loving that the uh, family started growing up. And then I realized, uh, um, I may not be able to, uh, Take care of my family. So I got out of coaching, went into uh, healthcare with uh, Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. I did that for 14 years while I was coaching on the side. But, uh, but every day I, I, missed the, I missed being more directly involved in the game. So I got back in at Nebraska Wesleyan for a couple of years and then got to Belmont Abbey. So it's been, uh, it's been a fun ride, 30 plus years, but I love it. It's my, it's my calling. That's awesome. I love it. And it's just interesting to know too, you know, you walked away from it for a time, but you couldn't, couldn't escape it. It wouldn't let you escape it. Uh, And with that, I think that's a good segue into the first thing I want to talk about is life and career balance. Coaching is so demanding. It's just so much time, so much energy, so much emotional energy that we invest into our work and the people that we coach, our assistant coaches. Talk to me about your thoughts on life and career balance. How can coaches do that better? Yeah, uh, most of us don't do it very well. Um, although I hope we're all striving to do that. Uh, it is a challenge. And the, probably the, one of the reasons why it's such a big challenge, besides just if we're p- competitive and we're passionate about our sport, it's the fact that uh, I think if you're, if you're a leader of any organization, then you got to take care of your people. And your people now are your players, and your players 
kind of become a second family to you. And just like those commercials they have on TV when, when mom and dad pops their head in and the, and the little baby's sitting there and uh, mom and dad say, well, I'm sick today, I'm, I'm going to take the day off. And the kid kind of looks at him like, what, are you kidding me? You don't have that option. And the same way, it's at, that's the reality of your, of your life as a, as a parent. And as a coach, you feel like that too. I mean, your, your, your players, they depend on you, they need on you. So you feel like you're 24-7 and whatever they need, I'm there for them. And, and it can consume you if you let it. And so that's where it's just a real challenge. If, uh, if you're not deliberate, intentional, um, it'll, it'll take over every minute of your day. Yeah, so, so tell me about that for you. Uh, what was that experience like? Were there, have there been times in your career where it got really out of balance? What was the result? How'd you get it back in balance? And maybe now, what are some, some things that you do or guardrails that you have to make sure that it stays more in balance? You know, I mentioned that intentionality and, and, you know, there's a difference between prioritizing a schedule and scheduling priorities. And that was one of the things I had to learn. And, and I didn't, uh, you know, in, in, my, in my first jaunt, if you will, in college coaching, I, I, my faith uh, was certainly a part of my life, but it wasn't uh, an integral part of my life. It wasn't something that I basically kept in, in front of me everything I do. And, and so I, it was easy to get my priorities out of order, not scheduling the most important first things first. And so, um, and even when I went into healthcare, um, I'll just tell you, share a quick story. I mean, you can quickly, like anything, you get absorbed in it and you forget. But I, I was doing like some people do. And on a Saturday, I was trying to catch up in my work. And I was down in my basement and I was looking to do some things, filing some things. And I was in sales at that time. So I was living out of my car. And, um, and so, you know, this is a chance to get my car organized for next week. And so then I ended up, and before I went out there, my son came in at that time. Ryan was probably five or six, and he had a little play McDonald's uh, cook up a hamburger type joint. And so he came in and said, Dad, you know, what would you like to have? And so I'm like, oh, this is perfect. You know, give me a Big Mac and a fries. And, and so, and I, you know, off he goes, and I could hear him, you know, cooking the things, acting like he's cooking. And, uh, and then I had this thing. I went out to my car, and I'm filing my stuff. And then you get lost and, you know, distracted. I'm out there for an hour. I come back, and my, my meal was sitting at my desk. And then I went, what? Today's Saturday, and I'm and I'm and my son is only going to be five or six one time, and I just went okay. You got to get your you know get your uh, priorities straight and 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 start really being more intentional and more deliberate and it's just you know these are the things you never get that time back. And so um, as I got back into coaching, um, my my faith uh, really became a stronger piece, and not not the people that. That, that where faith doesn't, you know, uh, isn't important to them, they, they don't make intentional. They can too, but it's, it's really hard when you're, when you're constantly hearing those messages, you know, whether at church or wherever, and then to then ignore them. <laughs> so I just found that, that when I came back to coaching this time, it was, uh, I felt like I was in a much better place. And uh, um, I, I felt like I, and, and we never get there. We never get to perfect, obviously, perfection. But I felt like I was being less transactional with my players, you know, more transformational. Yeah, I want to win as much as everybody, but that's not the most important thing. And so all of a sudden now, um, you know, we lose. Good. Now that tells us where we got to get better. You know, that, now we find out, you know, it's the idea of, you know, it's not, not how, you know, how you fall. It's how, how quickly you get up or, you know, what you learn from that. And so I felt like uh, when, I, when I got back into coaching the second time around, I, I was just at a much better place and I, um, a more of a, of a place where, I, again, I wasn't defined by my results or defined by my sport. And you yeah. know, sport wasn't my God. And, and, uh, and I, I think that really made a difference. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple things I want to highlight there in what you just said because I think they're really, really important. The first is scheduling your priorities. And Honestly, I'm challenged by that and, and guilty of it. Uh, currently, I'm not intentional enough about scheduling my priorities. Um, in, in my schedule, I need more time for my wife, for my kid. Well, and now just had our, our second son. Um, yeah, and I, and I think that story of the, the hamburger sitting at your desk is powerful. That Just that moment of, man, I get, I've got to recenter here. I've got to come back to what I really value and what's really important to me because I think if most coaches sat down and were honest, you know, what's important to you? What do you value? Those relationships, family, significant others, whatever, those are are way high up there and they care about them, but they often can be sacrificed on the altar of, of coaching. And we've got to be intentional about scheduling 
like put it in your calendar. Like I'm spending time with my wife here. We're going on a date. I'm spending time with my kids here. Um, I'm disconnecting from coaching. I, I don't have to be on 24 seven. I don't have, and it's hard sometimes like I, to just turn your mind off too, you know, to stop thinking about your team or the game or practice. That can be really challenging, but I think it's so, so, so important for us to do. It is, you know, it's, uh, um, it's really hard. It is really hard because we feel guilty even in our hobbies or even in our when, if, things that we like to do that we know are good for us. Um, and this morning when we were doing our presentation here, Lang Wittemeyer, who's the coach at Liberty University, he was sharing an experience. He said, you know, running is, his, is one of his outlets that he schedules it, and it's good for him. You know, wellness is going to be really good for, uh, for your performance when you're coaching, you know, so stay in good shape. He goes, but sometimes even on my run, I'm thinking about I should be call, I should be doing that email, you know, and that we're, we're feeling guilty. And, and it's really, really hard to unplug. It's really hard to unplug in today's world where you have emails and you have phones that, you know, beep and, you know, and, and buzz and you just can't get away. And so that scheduling of the priorities is, is so important. And I would even say just quiet time. One of the things that we do at the Abbey is, is and I, I encourage our players, we have this thing, five daily things to do plus one more. And, um, you know, so uh, sleep seven hours, um, drink a water bottle all day, uh, make your bed. Those are one of the threes. But one of them is uh, quiet time, unplug for 15 minutes. Mm. And one of, the, one of the things I share with them, I say, look, during that 15 minutes, just ask, you know, whether, again, you're, you have a Christian faith or not, just ask, what do you want me to know? And then just listen. And, it, you know, sometimes it'll be this lightning bolt, but usually it's not. It's this, you know, it could be a, a long time, a little whisper, but then all of a sudden, if you give it enough time, what do you want me to know? And then you'll get this thought. And, uh, um, and, and you know, running was always my thing before my hips. I've I got bilateral hip replacements now because I, <laughs> I ran too much, wore my hips out. But, but uh, and so now I just do a lot of hiking and things. But, uh, but when I would run, my wife would be like, if I was just hangry, you know, you're angry and hungry, or just wasn't being my good dad, she'd say, go for a run. And I knew that if I went for a run, I would come back at a different person. And I, and I, and usually on that run, my head would clear. And I just, and, and so that was, I really loved about it, but you can, but I think we can accomplish that anytime. Um, I just Kara, one of our uh, guest presenters this morning, she shared a story about her challenges in this hurried up world. She's a new mom and and that coach and you know lots of challenges and she said one of the things that she has realized is as her son her seventh month old son austin um has the grace to every day wake up and be excited about her being there you know the kids don't remember they don't remember yesterday that maybe they weren't feeling well whatever the next day they wake up they got a big smile on their face and they're excited and that that grace we, we won't give to ourselves, and we want to hold on to it. And, and yet I think we need to be like kids sometimes and just be excited about the day, you know, yeah. and, and forget about what happened yesterday. Today's a new day, and we're going to live today. Yeah, that's really good. Being present in the moment is, is so important for us as coaches, just, I mean, anybody in any walk of life. I'd love to talk a little bit more about what you mentioned with, your second go round in coaching and you got out of it. But when you got back into it, you mentioned that you were much, much more transformational in your coaching and your leadership than the first go around. So will you talk about some of those shifts and changes in your coaching and, and what specifically maybe um, changed and, and you started to do that aligned more with who you wanted to be as a coach and, and making that transformational impact on your athletes? Yeah, you know, as coaches, um, just the, the X's and O's, that you have the physical, technical, tactical, psychological, but you, you also have the spiritual or just the, you know, the, the impact that you can make on these lives. And, and so if, if you don't, if, if you're a coach and you don't know the physical, technical, tactical, you're probably not a very good coach. And so, but, but most of us, you know, we, that was our initial interest in the game. So we get fairly, you know, trained up and schooled up and, and we're pretty good at that. But, but uh, performance on the field is from the neck up. You know, the best performance in an individual or a team 
has little to do physical, technical, tactical, psychological. I mean, unless we're really out of shape or really, you know, behind technically. But usually it's going to be the confidence of that player to play at the level that they're playing at. And that's from the neck up. And, and what makes them confident? And then this is what I think I had learned. You know, I, I, and, 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 I, and I'm still not very good at it. I, I'll be the first to admit that. But, I, but I'm trying to be very cognizant of that is that, you know, and I, my coaching philosophy has kind of evolved into these three things. It's, you know, people always come first. And, and we can say that as a cliche, but they really do. People do do the mission. They do the job. They're the ones that kick the ball down the field. And so if they've got stuff going on in their life, um, they may not kick it down the field as well. And so, and usually, and we have a kind of a saying in our team now that, that if something just doesn't look right and they haven't offered it up to say what's up, I, then I'll just say everything okay. And a player can do that to a teammate too. Everything okay? And that's just a safe way if you want to share because I'm something's not right. And if you don't want to share, now at least that person knows they notice that something's not right. Yeah. And uh, and so it just kind of gives them a, an opportunity there. But it's that idea of you know, and this is a cliche also, but it's you know they, they don't really don't care about how much I know until they know how much I care. It keeps coming back to the people and how much you care. And as a as a ex Air Force guy, I mean that was drilled into us. I mean, you got to take care of your people. I mean, that's, that's leadership one-on-one. And, and, and yet at the same time, the mission never comes second. I mean, that was drilled into us as well. And so people always come first, but the mission never comes second. If, if, you know, if, if we're not, if we're not competing to our potential as a soccer team, well, that's not, that's not good either. And so how do you, it's a dichotomy, dichotomy of leadership. And how, how do you, how do you effectively maximize people always come first and the mission never comes second? And that's because the way you do that is people always come first <laughs> and the mission never comes second. I mean, you just got to, you have to figure it out, which means you got to be very deliberate, very intentional. You have to check in with everybody. You got, you got to know what's, what's on their heart, what's going on in their life. And, uh, which takes time. It takes time. It's hard, you know, especially, if, you know, like at our, our school, we have a large roster. It's hard to touch everybody, you know, every practice or every week even, you know, which is crazy to think that. And so there's things that we try to do. We try to eat lunch in the cafeteria. We eat lunch in the cafeteria every day. We don't necessarily sit with our players, but Coach Jamie and I will, will always go, and then we just get eyes on our players. And, and, and you know, just, just that, I think they know that we saw them. And, uh, and then if they were sitting by themselves, then we probably would have noticed that. And then we probably would have said, I just happened to notice you're sitting by yourself. Are you okay? You know? <laughs> and, and, or maybe not. I don't know. But I, but I think that's the point about just – um, uh, and trying to, it, it, you know, if, if to be a transformational leader, that's kind of the buzzword, you know, really it's, it's just pouring into the people more than I was before. And that was really the difference. And, uh, and it's also more fun. I mean, it's like, you know, it's the more you give, the more you get back. And, and, and so then they may share what's going on and maybe you can help, or maybe they just want you to listen and, and, and that's okay too. But it's uh but it, it is, a um, it's still hard because the mission never comes second. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it is. And, and it doesn't have to, I, like we can have both, yeah. you know, I think that's the thing that you know, we don't have to sacrifice people for performance or performance for people. We can have both of them. They can coexist together. I, I'm curious in your program now, just with the emphasis on those relationships that you put, are there any systems or processes that you have that you guys do as a team to ensure that those are being built? I know some coaches, for example, you know, they have one-on-one -on -one meetings, maybe every week, every month. Are there things like that that you guys are doing to be intentional about that? You know, one of the things we started a couple of years ago, and, and again, it's, it's, it's semi-successful, but it's just one idea is we have Jersey Day. and so. Um, the, the jersey number is the day of the month that we want to get together. And, and it's best if we don't meet in, in my office because then that's going to be, you know, kind of my space. Is it going to be a neutral space or your space? So do you want to meet at the CAF or do you want to meet, uh, you know, in the quad or whatever? And so the expectation is on Jersey Day that we, we get together for uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And um, I, I, don't, I don't want soccer to be the topic unless – they don't have anything else they want to talk about and they really want to do that and make, make soccer the, the feedback. But I, I, I really would like to find out just what's your favorite class and, and what's going on at home right now and, and anything, any challenges or things you're super excited about. And uh, because that's going to give me some insights to, you know, keys to motivation. 
So that, that's been helpful. And so um, that, and then, you know, we, we try to, at lunchtime, we try to, uh, um, at, uh, uh, at soccer, at, at practice, I'll usually start and finish a practice with uh, not necessarily a devotional, but usually some kind of a thought provoker kind of thing, just to, um, or a riddle just to kind of get them. So it's not, you know, every day we're just out there running and doing things. And it's, uh, and I've always done it for games. It's been a long kind of thing that it, little shtick, I guess, is that, you know, they'll, they'll, I always say, I always start the pregame with, uh, does everybody have their thinking caps on? And they go, always. <laughs> okay, well, let's see. And then I've got some kind of riddle for them, see if they can solve it. Sometimes it relates to the day or the game. Sometimes it doesn't. But, but the point is that, is that even in those moments, right before we go out on the field, we're, it's going to get real intense real fast. Um, let's be real. And it's, you know, it's, this is a game. We're just, we're, we're, we're friends, we're teammates. And uh, um, hopefully we never forget that. Yeah, that's good. I, I love Jersey Day. I think that's such a great idea uh, to just uh, almost like hold yourself accountable to make sure you're getting those connection and touch points with your athletes. And what you shared, I think is really important about a neutral site. Don't meet with them in your office. Go for a walk. Go have lunch with them somewhere that uh, is not an intimidating space for either party, uh, but you're kind of on even ground, level playing field there. I think it's a really important thing. It, it sounds small or subtle, but I think it can really shape those interactions that we have um, with our athletes. Absolutely. Let's shift uh, now a little bit, uh, Coach, and talk about sportsmanship and ethics. You know, actually, one of the things I'm thinking about with this topic is I I recently interviewed Joe Ehrman and and shared uh, my conversation with him on my podcast and obviously a big pioneer in transformational coaching. And one of the things he talked about is a a study he referenced that had found that the higher levels that athletes attain in sport, the more morally and ethically callous they become. Um, and, and, And the fact that oftentimes sports the higher levels we go are are doing the exact opposite of what we say that they inherently do like build character um or or some of those things so i'd love just to hear your thoughts on that how do we model teach and still sportsmanship and and ethics into our athletes yeah i'm big joe ehrman fan so that's that's great that you were talking to him he's he's obviously um, been such an influential person in the coaching world. The, um, you know, I, 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 I agree with the study that that is what's going on and that's what's going on in our culture, but that's not the, uh, I, I don't believe that that is true peak performance either. Peak performance is joy, not anger, not trash talking, not whatever. Um, it's not uh, fear. It's not now, can you get a greater performance with a, a threat? Yes. Or, you know, somebody makes you upset and you want to go retaliate. You can, you can really um, focus your energies because that's what fight or flight syndrome is. When you're in fight or flight, uh, your peripheral vision goes and you vision. And so you have crystal clear focus, but you're, you're also tight. You're not loose. And we know that our greatest performances are when we're loose. And so um, it's interesting. One of the things that Belmont Abbey College is really trying to, to do nationally is, is we're trying to, you know, again, um, how do I say this uh, humbly? We're trying to demonstrate that, that uh, uh, sportsmanship is the path to true peak performance. And we want our opponents to come in and have no excuses. So it's going to be a great locker room. They're going to get absolute hospitality. Nobody's going to trash talk them. Nobody's going to retaliate. Um, we're not going to tactical foul and take away their situations where they can counterattack us. We're not going to do that because that would cheat us out of a, of a, a maximum performance. And, um, and so uh, if, and, and I, and I think that we are uh, as a human, as, as human species, we're wired to play and that's not by an accident, you know? And so it's interesting to me that we were designed to play. And organized play is competition and sport. And so I don't think that the intention of our creator was to create, let's, let's go play, and then I don't want it to be at its best. <laughs> I just don't believe that. And so, so um, we know that when Michael Jordan is having the game of his life, he's going down the court with a, with a grimace on his face like, this is just, you know, everything I throw up goes in. And uh, it's not in anger. It's not in, in, uh, in, in, 
behaviors that we would say are not, uh, you know, not, not moral or not, not uh, gracious or not whatever. Now, do you have to be absolutely passionate to be good in your sport? I've never seen a fireman run into a building to save somebody that's not passionate. I mean, all, her, all heroism comes from passion. But, um, but you doesn't mean it has to be then directed into negative. And so, um, and so that's, where, that's where we're kind of, that's what I believe. That's what I feel like we're seeing. It's hard. It's really hard because it would be a lot easier just to kick somebody off the ball. <laughs> it would be a lot easier just to, you know, or get that person. And, um, but that doesn't mean that, but that means we don't have to have a better first touch. It doesn't mean that, you know, so I mean, anytime you're going to resort to, to either you know, bending other rules or whatever, it's because your performance isn't where you want it. Well, let's just work on the performance then. And uh, so like, and these seem like trivial things, but when the ball goes out of bounds, and when I, I was trained as a player that you go for it, because if, if the ref doesn't really know whose ball it is, they're going to look at the behavior of the players and say, well, which one, who they thinks it is. So you may get the ball when it's not really yours. And so that's the way I was trained. That's what I always did. Well, and then as I got to Belmont Abbey and, and the culture of our athletic department, and we've, we talk about these things with our coaches, and, and what, what are you saying? You're saying is that we have to get a, a throw-in that's not really ours in order to beat this team. And the practical application of that is we're out of position when the referee did get it right, and they – because, you know, in soccer, the ref doesn't have to hand you the ball. So you just, you know, the other team gets the ball, and now let's say you're the outside back. You're out of position when that throw-in goes. And so you thought that you were helping your team, but you really weren't. And so, so I tell my players, look, if you don't know, then there you go. But if you do know, just go get in position. It's their ball. And, uh, and so that's just one example. But, but I, it, it, puts the, it puts the responsibility and accountability back on them to, uh, to perform better, to support their teammates, to do the things that we're supposed to be doing versus I'm going to take advantage of the rules here and, and, and do something that's going to allow me to not be at my best but still have a chance to be successful. Yeah, we're not going to take a shortcut for performance here. And if our performance isn't where, we're gonna, where we want it, we're going to be honest about it. We're going to figure out how we actually address that and, and don't yeah, put a Band-Aid on it by playing in a certain way that's counterproductive. Yep. Um, yeah, or, or poor for development. I, I think that's a really important thing for us to consider in our coaching, too. Um, well, Coach, this has been uh, awesome, a great conversation. Uh, before we wrap it up, I would love if uh, I could just ask you a few rapid-fire questions. Sure. Uh, here's the first one. The most fun part of coaching is? This is going to be sad, but I love training. I, I love preparing for training. I love the training session. That's not sad. That's, yeah. I, I'm with you there. So when, when they're off part. season, I'm sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Practice is fun. Man. I love practice. I love fun. practice. Uh, I wish I would have known blank before my first coaching experience. I wish I would have known um, that sometimes I'll be sad when we win and happy when we lose. Can you say more about that? Yeah, I just – I. You know, my, my, my wife would always be puzzled when I'd walk in the house. Okay, you're happy and you lost. What happened? And I'd say, we played really, really well. We did the things that we were doing in practice. You know, if, if we keep doing this, it's gonna, it's gonna, we're going to see a lot of success and vice versa. Okay, we won, but, you know, we didn't really execute what we wanted to do. And if we keep doing this, we're going to start losing and we can't get out of that, that hole. And so um, that was one of the things. And I, and I, I couldn't understand it either because I kept thinking I should be happy right now and I'm not really that happy I'm kind of disappointed how we played yeah it's good and it reminds me of the concept uh, from Andy Duke's work of resulting you know like we we got to stop judging the quality of our performance based on the results so like, yeah we've got to look for other indicators uh, last one I know I'm successful as a coach when um, my players are uh, having great lives I mean, I, I, I've been around old enough now that uh, they have families and they have careers. And it, it, it's very humbling to see how successful so many kids are. And, and, I, and I'm not trying to say that, you know, that is because of me. But I, I, I hope I had a small part of that. And, and uh, it's, it's really exciting because they're just knocking it out of the park. That's awesome. I love it. Uh, well, Coach, this has been awesome. Before I get you out of here, just share with people where they can uh, connect with you and follow along with uh, you guys at Belmont Abbey. Yeah, so uh, again, I coach at Belmont Abbey. So abbeyathletics.com is the easiest way to get to our website. And then my email, if you want to reach out and contact me or just follow me at Abby Coach Lynch. 
And uh, so I'm on Instagram as well as Twitter. Awesome. Coach Lynch, thank you a ton for your time. Enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Coaches, thanks for listening to this episode. And thanks to Mike for joining me. I hope you found some value in the insights he shared around life and career balance in particular. I know this conversation challenged me to be better at scheduling my priorities, like spending time with my wife and kids, exercising, and other habits that I know I need to have in place to be my best. As always, if you enjoyed this episode and you want to grab a copy of the free podcast notes, go to cuttingedgecoach.com slash podcast or click the link in the show details to download a free PDF of notes in this episode or any episode of the podcast. And don't forget to check out filmforcoaches.com to learn more or register for the upcoming online workshop I'm hosting with Doug Lamov. We're going to help coaches take their use of film to the next level. Spots are limited, so grab yours today. That's filmforcoaches.com. Thanks for listening to the podcast.